guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering hematology. So we're gonna be talking about sickle cell, um, iron deficiency anemia, hemophilia, all of the hematology that you need to know to pass your, pass your exam. So if you haven't done so already, guys, please don't forget to like and subscribe below. Don't forget, guys, I'm also now on TikTok and Instagram. My handle is the same, Nexus Nursing. So without any further ado, guys, let's get started. First question. The nurse is discussing dietary resources, dietary sources of iron with a client who has iron deficiency anemia. Which menu, if selected by the client, indicates the best understanding of the diet? One, milkshake, hot dog, and beets. Two, beef steak, spinach, and grape juice. Three, chicken salad, green peas, and coffee. Or four, macaroni and cheese, coleslaw, and lemonade. And the correct answer, guys, is two, beef steak, spinach, and grape juice. All of those choices are high in iron, okay? If you look at our other choices, our other choices have dairy in them, and guess what? Dairy is very low in iron. Milk is low in iron. Cheese is low in iron. But steak, spinach, Grape juice, all of those are high in iron, so that's why that's the correct answer. Next question. Ferrous sulfate is prescribed for a client. She returns to the clinic in two weeks. Which assessment by the nurse indicates that she has not been taking her iron as ordered? One, the client's cheeks are flushed. Two, the client reports having more energy. Three, the client complains of nausea. Or four, the client's stools are light brown. And the correct answer, guys, is four, the client's stools are light brown. If that client's stool is light brown, you think they've been taking their iron? I don't think so. Why? Because what does iron do? What color does it turn the stool? A very dark color. That's why when a patient takes iron, you have to let the patient know that it's going to turn their stools dark. Iron is very staining. That's why when a patient takes iron, if they're taking iron orally, you tell them to take it through a straw so it doesn't stain their teeth. That's why when you give iron, if you're giving iron intramuscularly, you're using z track method because it's irritating and it's staining to the skin. So if we see that those stools are light brown, absolutely not, because I'm telling you, iron is going to turn that, those stools black. Those stools are going to be black. They're going to be tarry black, and you have to um, teach that patient that in advance so they don't freak out once they see their stools such a dark color. So the fact that their stools are light brown, they haven't been taking their iron. Next question. A client who receives a diagnosis of pernicious anemia asks why she must receive vitamin shots. What is the best answer for the nurse to give? One, shots work faster than pills. Two, your body cannot absorb B12 from foods. Three, vitamins are necessary to make the blood cells. Or four, you can get more vitamins in a shot than a pill. And guys, the correct answer is two, your body cannot absorb vitamin B12 from foods. So guys, if this patient has pernicious anemia, what are they missing? They're missing that intrinsic factor that's found where? In the stomach that's help, that helps the patient absorb vitamin B12. So what's the point? If that patient has uh, pernicious anemia, they don't have that intrinsic factor that's located in the stomach to help them absorb the B12. What is the point of giving them B12 orally? They're not going to be able to absorb it. So guess what? That patient is going to have to get that B12. How? Intramuscularly. I am. How often? Once a month. And you have to teach these patients. When they have pernicious anemia, they have to get that those IM injections every month until when? They die. And let me tell you something. If they don't get those B12 um, uh, shots, they're not going to live long anyway. Okay, you have to have B12 to survive. So that's very important. You're going to teach a patient that you're going to be getting those B12 injections. It's going to be IM and you'll be getting it monthly. Next question. A client who's been diagnosed as having pernicious anemia asks, <laughs> asks how long she will have to take the shots. What is the best answer for the nurse to give? Okay, if any of you guys get this wrong, I don't know what to tell you because I just gave you the answer. All right, choices. One, until your blood count returns to normal. Two, until you are feeling better. A three, for the rest of your life. Or four, that varies with each person. Ask your doctor. 
Let me fix my camera, guys. Give me a second. There we go. All right. And the correct answer, guys, is for the rest of your life or you will die. You have to tell them that, okay? Because some patients tend to be non-compliant. But if they know they're not going to live long, they'll take their med as ordered. You have to teach the patient that, okay? So the correct answer is for the rest of their lives. A toddler's been, uh, toddler's been treated for sickle cell crisis. The crisis subsides and the child improves. Which statement is essential for the nurse to include in the discharge teaching? One, your child will bruise easily. Do not let your child bump into things. Two, notify your doctor immediately if your child develops a fever. Three, your child will need special help with feeding. Four, observe your child frequently for difficulty breathing. And guys, the correct answer is to notify the physician immediately if your child develops a fever. Why? Well, what are our triggers for patients to go into sickle cell crisis? Dehydration. Well, don't you think if they um, develop a fever, they can start getting dehydrated? Absolutely. What is another trigger for a patient to go into sickle cell crisis? illness, any physical or even emotional stress can cause a patient to go into sickle cell crisis. So whether it's a physical stress, such as getting sick or an emotional or psychological stress, such as getting fired from the job or getting a fight with the husband, those are triggers for the patient to go into crisis. So absolutely, you have to teach these patients who have sickle cell, always carry water bottles with you because that patient cannot afford to get dehydrated. Stay away from sick people, people with upper respiratory infections. You cannot afford to get sick. It might throw you into a crisis, right? Try to relax. Try to, try to stay away from stressful situations. Try to stay away from those triggers that can cause you to go into crisis. So absolutely, number two is the correct answer. Um, number one, your child will bruise easily. That's more a patient with um, sickle, uh, sickle cell. That's more patient with hemophilia, where that patient will uh, bruise easily because they're missing certain clotting factors. Um, three, your child will need special help feeding. No, they won't. Four, your child, uh, observe your child frequently for difficulty breathing. When a patient is going into sickle cell crisis, yes, we're going to worry about them um, not being able to breathe. But let me explain to you. My camera keeps falling. Sorry, guys. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. What happens is when a patient goes into sickle cell crisis, guys, the problem is not that patient, is not the patient not having enough um, oxygen because they do. The oxygen is being carried in the hemoglobin that's being carried in the RBC, which the patient has plenty of. That's not what the problem is. The problem is those RBCs, they carry the hemoglobin, they carry the oxygen. Instead of being nice, beautiful, circular shapes so it can travel nicely through the vessel, they start to sickle. And then when they sickle, they clump up and they're not moving through the vessel, which means that oxygen that's being carried in the hemoglobin that's being carried in the RBC isn't moving. It's not getting to the tissues that it needs to go. So that patient that's in sickle cell crisis, the problem is not them getting enough oxygen. The problem is that oxygen is not moving because those cells are sickled. That's why when you guys get those test questions and it says patients in sickle cell crisis, what's the first thing you're going to do? Give them oxygen, give them fluids, blah, blah, blah. You're going to give them fluids because the problem is that those cells are sickled. And the minute you give them those IV fluids, those cells go from the sickle shape back to the round shape so it can flow through the vessels how we want it to. Yes, you can give them supplemental oxygen, but the first thing you're going to do is give them fluids. Then after you give them fluids, you can give them oxygen. Because like I said, the problem is a lack of oxygen. The problem is that oxygen can't has no way of transportation because those cells sickle. So you give them the fluids so they can go back to their circular shape. I don't know how I even got all the way here because they were asking about fever. But anyway, number two is the correct answer. I'm sorry, guys. I have to keep adjusting my camera. Which statement made by the parent of a child newly diagnosed, newly diagnosed with sickle cell anemia indicates a need for more teaching? One, we are going to the mountains for our vacation this year. Two, it's a good thing she likes to drink juices. Three, if she needs something for pain, I will give her baby sedaminophen. Four, I will make sure she doesn't get chilled when it's cold outside. And the correct answer is one. We're going to the mountains for our vacation this year. No, you're not. Not if you have sickle cell. Why? Because the higher the altitude, the less um, the oxygen saturation. 
Yeah. So these patients that have sickle cell, I'm so sorry, you're not the one going skiing in the Alps. Absolutely not. And like the only reason why, you know, it's fine for them, like they can get on airplane to travel is because, um, you know, those commercial flights, they have um, the, the oxygen is pressurized. It's fine. Right. But they can't be high in the mountains. They can't be skiing because the higher they go up the lower that O2 sat is, and they cannot afford that. So that is the one that's gonna need further teaching. All right, a five-year-old boy is admitted because he bled profusely when he lost his first baby tooth. After a workup, he's diagnosed as having classic hemophilia. His mother asked the nurse if his two younger sisters will develop hemophilia. What is the best answer for the nurse to give? One, they will not develop the disease. Two, statistically, one of them is likely to develop the disease. Three, they're not likely to get the disease, but they may be carriers. Or four, if it doesn't show up on, if it doesn't show up by the time they start school, they're unlikely to develop the condition. All right, guys, and the correct answer is three. They're not likely to get the disease, but they may be carriers. carriers. We tend to see um, hemophilia in boys, and here's why. Um, hemophilia is carried on the X chromosome, but we don't really see that disease until it, um, it, um, connects with the Y, right? So that's why, you know, girls tend to, they can be carriers, they can have the trait, but we tend to see it, the actual disease, not the trait, but the actual disease in boys. Because like I said, um, we, um, we tend to see it, um, on the X, they're carriers, but not until it connects with the Y that we actually see the disease. And so that's why boys are more likely to have hemophilia than girls. All right, the nurse has been teaching the parents of a child with hemophilia about the care he'll need. Which statement by the parents indicates a need for further instruction? One, if my child needs something for pain or fever, I'll give him acetaminophen instead of aspirin. Two, I will take my child to the dentist for regular checkups. Three, I will keep my child in the house most of the time. Four, my son's medic alert bracelet arrived. And the correct answer, guys, is three, I'll keep my child in the house most of the time. That's the one that requires further teaching. Whenever you see a question ask, say, asking you, what requires further teaching? Which one requires follow-up? Which one requires clarification? What they're really asking you is which one is the wrong answer choice? And this is the wrong answer choice because if you've been following me for any amount of time, just like the work of the adolescent is socialization and self-identity, I always tell you the work of the child is what? Play. So you are going to stunt their emotional um, uh, development. You're going to slow down those milestones. If you don't allow that child to be a child, they need to be able to play. You can't be that overprotective parent and not allow them to develop the way that they should. So that is the one that we're going to um, provide further teaching because it's wrong. Now, the other choices are great. One, if my child needs something for pain, um, or fever, I'm going to give acetaminophen, that's Tylenol, instead of aspirin. Absolutely. Why? These patients with hemophilia are missing important clotting factors, so they're already bleeding. Specifically, Professor D, where do they bleed the most? In joints. All right. So they already have a tendency for bleeding. So why would we ever give them aspirin that would make them bleed even more? That makes no sense. So if that patient has pain or fever, you're going to give them something such as acetaminophen, not aspirin. Um, choice two, statistically, uh, one of them is likely to develop a disease. You know, that's not true. I explained all of that already. And four is incorrect as well. So three is the correct answer. Next question. A college student who's diagnosed as having infectious mononucleosis asks how the disease is spread. The nurse's response is based on the knowledge that the usual mode of transmission is through one, skin, two, genital contact, three, contaminated water, or four, intimate oral contact. And guys, the correct answer is four, intimate oral contact. That's why mono is known as what? The kissing disease, all right? So kissing, sneezing, coughing, sharing, eating utensils, patient can cause um, can contact uh, mono. By the way, guys, mono is a viral infection. It's not bacterial. So 
antibiotics is not gonna um, work for mono, right? When it comes to viruses, are there cures for viruses? No, we have things to treat the symptoms, but there are no cures. So when it comes to mono, it comes and it goes. So the best that you can teach the patient is to get plenty of rest and to stay hydrated because it's gonna to have to run its course. All right, next question. A young woman who has infectious mono asked what the treatment for his condition is. What is the best response for the nurse to make? I keep getting ahead of myself. One, you'll need to receive large doses of antibiotics for the next 10 days. Two, rest and good nutrition are the best things you can do. Three, you will be given an antiviral agent that will help control the symptoms. Or four, you will probably be given a steroid medication for several months. And guys, the correct answer is two. You're going to tell them to rest, um, eat foods high in vitamin C. Remember, high, vitamin C helps with healing. Foods high in um, protein. Protein helps with healing. Uh, drink plenty of fluids. Stay hydrated and just get rest because it's, a virus has to run its course. And so two is the correct answer. A child with leukemia bruises easily. This is most likely due to which of the following? One, decreased fibrinogen levels. Two, excessive clotting elsewhere in the body. Three, decreased platelets. Or four, decreased erythrocytes. And the correct answer, guys, is three decreased platelets. And why are platelets important? Well, they help you clot. So if you don't have enough platelets, you're going to be doing what? Bleeding all over the place. So let's talk about leukemia real quick. Well, before I start talking about leukemia, let me look at the next question to make sure I don't give you the answer. Okay, good. So let me talk to you about leukemia very, very quickly. What is leukemia? Leukemia is a condition where the patient is producing an excessive amount of WBCs. And I know you're thinking to yourself, well, what's wrong with that? WBCs are great to fight infection. So, you know, they should have a strong immune system, right? Wrong. Even though they're producing an excessive amount of WBCs, those WBCs are immature. They're baby WBCs, which means they can do nothing but take up space. Where are blood cells formed? In the bone marrow. So here you have a bone marrow that's producing all of these baby WBCs that can't do anything to help the patient against infection. And not only can they not help, they're taking up the place of where platelets could have been, of where red blood cells could have been. That's why you see decreased platelets and decreased RBCs because you have all these baby WBCs running around taking up all the space. So with the decreased platelets, that's going to put the patient at risk for bleeding. Patients with leukemia, they're going to be immunocompromised. I just explained to you why. And they tend to be anemic as well because of the decreased RBCs. Okay. All right, next question. When planning care for a client who's HIV positive, the nurse should do what? One, teach persons coming in contact with the client to wear a gown and mask at all times. Two, teach persons to wear uh, gloves when handling any of the client's body fluids. Three, restrict vid visitors to immediate family. Or four, encourage a client to stay away from other persons as much as possible. And the answer is two, teach persons to wear gloves when handling any of the client's body fluids. Guys, I've said this to you a million times. If it's wet, put on gloves, okay? If you are going to be coming in contact with sputum, vomitus, feces, urine, uh, um, um, tears, I don't care. If it is wet, you need to put on gloves. So two is the correct answer. Which action should the nurse expect to perform after a client has a bone marrow biopsy taken from the iliac crest? One, apply pressure to the site for one minute. Two, administer a narcotic analgesic. Three, apply an adhesive bandage to the site. Or four, place the client in a recumbent position. And guys, the correct answer is four, placing the client in a recumbent position. Why? Pressure on that site is going to help stop the bleeding. Okay, let's look at our wrong choices. One, apply pressure to the site for one minute. No, you, this patient just got a biopsy in that iliac crest. No, you're going to be applying lots of pressure. It's going to be way more than one minute. You're going to be applying uh, pressure for several minutes, like five to 10 minutes. Okay. 
to administer a narcotic analgesic. That patient's gonna get the narcotic analgesic before the biopsy because that biopsy is very painful. So it's not after, it's before they're gonna get the analgesic. Um, next question, up. Uh, excuse me, the choice number three, apply an adhesive bandage to the site. No, it's going to be a pressure dressing because remember, this is a very bloody area. You want constant pressure to the site. So it's going to be a pressure dressing, not an adhesive bandage. And so number four is the correct answer. Which of the following assessment findings should alert the nurse that the elderly client should be evaluated for pernicious anemia? One, clubbing of the nails. Two, bloody stools three, beefy red tongue, or four, enlarged lymph nodes. And the correct answer, guys, is beefy red tongue. That is a classic sign and symptom of um, early pernicious anemia. Now, let's look at our other answer choices. One, clubbing of the nails. Um, clubbing of the nails, we see this, guys, in chronic respiratory, um, chronic hypoxemia, I should say. Patients with chronic hypoxemia, like who? Who chronically have hypoxemia, COPD patients. So we would see clubbing of those nails in those type of patients. Uh, two, bloody stools. We would see that in a patient with hemophilia, someone taking too much aspirin or clotting deficiency. Four, enlar enlarged lymph nodes. We would see that in a patient who had um, possibly leukemia, okay? Next question. An elderly client who's being treated for pernicious anemia needs to be monitored periodically for which of the following conditions? One, lactose intolerance. Two, stomach cancer. Three, dementia. Or four, hearing loss. Now, guys, I'm sorry. I, I'm allergic to something in my studio, and it's been forever. I can't figure out what it is. Whenever I come in here, my nose gets runny sometimes. Forgive me. Um, even if you guys don't know the answer to this question, you should have made an educated guess and still gotten the right answer. Because I said to you already, pernicious anemia, that's when the patient cannot absorb vitamin B12 through food. Why? They're missing intrinsic factor. Where is intrinsic factor located? In their stomach. So even if you had no idea what the answer was, what would you have chosen? Stomach cancer. And that's absolutely the um, answer. There's a very, very strong correlation with patients that have pernicious anemia and stomach cancer. Number two is the correct answer. Which of the following would be the best lunch for a client with folic acid deficiency anemia? One, bologna sandwich and vegetable soup. Two, grilled cheese sandwich and tomato soup. Three, coleslaw and cream of mushroom soup. Four, spinach salad and bean soup. Okay, guys, um, and the correct answer is spinach, salad, and bean soup. Folic acid is especially important for who? The pregnant mother who has that fetus developing um, um, in their womb, and they you don't want the fetus to have these neurological deficits, so folic acid is super, super, super important. Um, dry beans, green leafy uh, veggies, nuts, all of these fruits, all of these are high in folic acid, including your spinach and bean soup. So number four is a correct answer. The nurse is caring for a client who is thought to have pernicious anemia. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. What? Where am I? I'm sorry. The nurse is caring for a client who's thought to have pernicious anemia. What signs and symptoms would the nurse expect this person to have? One, easy bruising. Two, a beefy red tongue. Three, fine red rash on extremities. Or four, pruritus. And you guys already know the answer. We talked about this already. And the correct answer is two, beefy red tongue. The nurse administers iron using the Z-Track technique. What is the primary reason for administering iron via Z-Track? One, to prevent adverse reactions. Two, to prevent staining of the skin. Three, to improve absorption rate. Or four, to increase the speed of at onset of action. And if you guys have been paying attention during this video, you already know what the answer is. The correct answer is two, to prevent staining of the skin. Remember I told you iron is very, very staining. That's why when we have to give it intramuscularly, we give it how? z track method. All right, guys, and we're already down to our last question. 
A one-year-old is admitted to the hospital with sickle cell anemia crisis. Upon admission, which therapy will assume priority? One, fluid administration. Two, exchange transfusion. Three, anticoagulant. Or four, iron administration of iron and folic acid. And very good, I know you guys chose fluid administration, fluid, 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 fluids. Those fluids will turn those RBCs from the sickle shape back to the circular shape so the RBCs, which carry the hemoglobin, which carry the oxygen, can flow freely in the vessel. Guys, I hope you found this video to be helpful if you did. Please, please, please share my content. I'm really trying to grow. I'm really trying to do this for you guys full time, 24 seven. Please help me to get there. Um, please share my content with family, friends, anyone you know in the nursing program or so anyone that's studying um, for the NCLEX. Please don't forget to go ahead and check me out on TikTok. I'm on TikTok now. Um, my handle is Nexus Nursing and the content that I cover here on YouTube is different than what I cover on TikTok. So if you wanna get um, some extra studying in, I do about five to 10 TikToks every single day. So I have plenty of material on TikTok for you to watch as well as my Instagram. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you on the next video.